Today, I want to talk about education. I believe there are a few misconceptions that must be pointed out in what's so called top tier level of education. I believe these misconceptions could be applied to all of us here. Today, my speech will be a criticism. Of course, I will criticize education systems, especially the one that I was in it, but I'm going to do something slightly more than that. I'm going to criticize myself and you guys. For that, I need to share my own story. My story starts when I was in fourth grade, a 10 year old kid just wandering around in the primary school. At that time, I was always a good student, like decent grades, everyone loves him, it was great. But by the end of fifth grade, my teachers, I, and my parents noticed something. I was slightly more than a good student. I had a great asset, which was I could answer abundant number of multiple choice questions in very limited amount of time with great accuracy. And if your education system is entirely based upon multiple choice tests, that is something big. My parents and my teachers realized that this could be something exceptional. Because every time I took a test, my mom's phone, num phone would just ring, ring, and ring. Because there were scholarships, offers. I got the attention. I was always on point and everyone was looking at me and what I was doing and how I was doing. But for me, these were great because it was just a game, like a sport. Everyone in the classroom, we were all athletes. The school was our team, school uniform and jersey, teachers were coaches, and I, I was a superstar. I could do anything and everything I wanted. I could lead, control, and dominate. And that was the greatest feeling. Because you take the control of it, and you feel everything is under your control. And simply, I enjoyed it. As I said, it was just a big game, nothing more. For us, the exams, they were just small matches. They were all practices. What we wanted is just getting someone from our team, my classmates, into those rankings. And that's, that's how we win. So one day, I was in my math class, putting my regular performance, and just leading, controlling, and actually winning. A dean just knocked on the door and said, may I have Dokkan for a second? I was like, of course. I get out of class, I corrected my jersey, everything was fine. And she said, oh, the head of college wants to see you. I was like, sure. I went down, I entered his office. It was the dean, the head of college, and myself. And he started, how are you, Dokan? How are you doing? Is everything all right? I know it's just two months in, and you're trying to adjust to school. Are you content with it? Is everything all right? He's like, yes, sir. Everything is perfect. I'm really enjoying my time here, and I'm really glad that you gave me this massive scholarship to study here for three years. And I know I won't be disappointing you. I know I will be doing whatever it takes to not disappoint you and give the perfect answer to everyone. It's great, Dokan. I'm really glad that you're in the right zone. Oh, by the way, I also heard something recently. I heard that you got the first place in the latest grand test. Yes, sir, thank you very much. But it was nothing big. It was a thousand people. It doesn't matter I got the first place, because in June, it's going to be one million. And this is nothing compared to that. 
but I'm really happy that you acknowledge this, and I will do anything to show it, because you gave me this opportunity, you believed in me, and you will get to announce my achievement and success. And he was really happy. He was thrilled, right? Because I was the investment. He was in, I was the investment that he picked among many students and gave the opportunity. A big financial burden, a contribution, and he expected something in return. After that, everything was all right. Everything was going great. I was like, sir, I suppose we are done here, right? Because you just want to congratulate me and you're heading back, right? Well, that day did not end well. What happened is, I believe I convinced him that as I was enthusiastic, determined, devoted, and I was going for a mission. And that mission? was succeeding. Succeeding that, I will get in top 10, top 5, among 1 million students. So that I will go to those fancy schools and others won't. That is simply opportunity cost. If I go to those schools, others won't. But if others do, I won't. And they're simply getting the right to brag about it. They simply want to advertise me. And for that, they're making the investment. So after I was feeling, yes, I convinced them everything's going great. Can I go back to my class? Can I get back to the business? Oh, just wait a bit. There's like 10 minutes more. Then you'll be fine. Because I don't want you to go back to class and distract others. I was like, OK, sir. All right. And you know that awkward moment you're in the like, office and you, you feel that you don't have anything to talk? But apparently there was. He said, OK, like, besides, is everything all right? Like, how are your parents? Are they, are they doing well? Because that's a classic way of like, engaging in conversation in the like, Turkish culture. You ask about random things, the weather, and your family and parents. I was like, yes, sir, my dad is doing great. And my mom, yeah, she's going to be all right, nothing, nothing big. I was like, what's wrong? Is there something, something bad? No, sir. It, she's just like having a, a minor medical condition, but it's going to be all sorted out. Like, what is it? Like, what is the medical condition? Well, sir. So, my mom. She has cancer. But don't worry. Don't don't worry. Right? Because she just took the last chemo. And she's going to take the, another checkup, and she'll be good. She'll be safe. Well, he got upset. But of course, that makes sense, because if you just figured out someone's mom had cancer, you don't get happy, right? You got upset. But I believe that the reason he got upset was I carried a risk. His investment was risky now. I may not be able to turn out that big, sparkling, exceptional student that they want to put on billboards and advertise and recruit new, rich students to school and advertise those private education. And I feared, because I need to convince this guy that the bigger the risk, the bigger the outcome could be. So I had to convince the guy so that he will keep counting on me and continue providing me those like, fancy scholarships and everything else. Then he asked one critical question and said, Dokan, I want to ask this. How would your reaction be if something were to happen to your mom? That was the moment. That was the moment for me to fully convince him that I was the guy, that he needed to invest in me. And I said, sir, yes, I will be devastated, incredibly. But I will do anything not to disappoint you. I will show a great strength 
to not reflect that to my grades. It's like, good, good. It's like, voila, we did it. He's convinced, I'm ready to go. And the rank just, it developed rank, and I was like, oh, can I leave now? Because, like, yeah, now it's class time. Though, Khan, there's one more thing that I need to tell you. Okay, yes, sir, like, keep it going so that I can go back. So, Dokan, your dad just called like this morning and he wanted to inform you that your mom, she just passed away this morning. Nah, that's not real. He's just testing me because he wants to see my reaction. He will see my reaction, then he'll be satisfied. Then he'll be fully convinced. That's not a cool way to do it, but I can see his point. Because that's a big of money. That's a big, big number that I cannot afford. Then I stood firmly, gave my luck, proved that I was all right, and I stood up. I was about to go to class. But something happened at that moment. I pushed the table, I stood up, I turned back. I heard something. I heard the dean crying. That could mean only one thing. Yes. They were not lying. They were not testing me. My mom, she was gone. And I actually believed that they would test me with it. I actually believed there would be people who would put that in front of death, family, the people that you care most in life. I was so convinced that it could actually be the real thing. I believed that would be the only way of succeeding. Everything I know, everything I could do, it was done. I said, game is over, guys. Just go away. It's done. I will never ever get into this again. No way. It's, it's done. Because I lost something that was most meaningful to me in the life. And I just wasted everything that I had in it. You know what? I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Then I had to leave the school and all those mass people crying, trying to support me, and I, I'm trying to support everyone. It's just a hectic moment. I couldn't talk to my dad for a week. We just couldn't. It just didn't work out that way. After a week, we came to house, and we were all alone. It was the first time that we were in a very house that we were just laughing all together with my mom, and we were all alone. And that was the first time that we were going to engage in conversation. And he just stood in front of me and said, I'm quoting him. And these are the very exact words he used. The first time, he said, Dokan, you will not use this as an excuse. So, yes, Dad, I won't. I'll definitely. I left, I went back to my room, just looked at myself in the mirror. I said, you know what? You were true, yeah, you were right, game was over. But this is overtime. And now, winner takes it all. The only thing that you need to do is winning. You don't care about enjoying it anymore. anymore. Yes, you used to, but you don't want to, but there's something you need to do. Why? If I fail, my dad falls. And if he falls, I collapse. And no one wants that. So for me, I said, from this very moment, it is all about winning. Winning, achieving, succeeding. And I did. I moved with survival instinct. The hunter instinct. You do whatever it takes. 
I graduated as valedictorian. I made it in top 0.1%. I got into one of the most prestigious high schools with full scholarship. Then I got into UWC with full scholarship. And I was like, you know what? I'm leaving this place. I done what I could. I'm out, guys. I'm going to leave this place, go to another country, then we'll see how it works. But I was really tired. Gosh, I was tired. I said, yes, I'm going to restart. Everything will be different. But there's one thing that is engraved. The old of suffering, you won't achieve. It is engraved. That's what I define myself. I said, nothing else matters because there's no one that I can relate to myself. It's me, not even me. It's all about achieving. It's all about going back and saying, when you receive that acceptance letter, yes, I did. That one second, you open up your email, I did it. I got accepted. I'm going to this fancy university. That was the moment that people would be leaving for. That was the moment that I was suffering that. But later on, it turns out that there's a huge sacrifice. There's a huge trade-off. When I came to UWC, I was saying, you know what, I'm going to enjoy this. And this is going to be the last big thing. We do it, it's done. We go to the university, we put it out there and declare everyone, everyone is happy. All the people back there, they're cool, I'm cool, we achieved it, we made it, success, done. But I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't push myself. I couldn't want to have that ego to sit down and do something, that finish that task and like, get it over with, and hand it in, like ace the test. It just didn't. My mind was saying, no, don't do it. Like, don't you know how much you lost? But there's one other part of me saying that. You know what? Success. That's you define yourself with. Every time you're not achieving, it's failure. Failure was defined with not success. Not winning. Therefore, I was tortured by myself every single day. It was torment. Because there was one part of me who's desperately avoiding everything and doesn't want to do anything, doesn't want to finish those tasks. I can't do it. It's not that I'm capable, not capable of, but it's just I didn't want to. But there's other part of you. Whenever you look at the mirror, just mock him with you. Just saying that how much disappointed you are, how you could do things. Then I just ran away in Christmas break. Just ran back home and said, you know what, I'm going to finish everything I'm done. After you apply, just like you get back to business. It's just you reevaluate things and fix it. I was in that dilemma. I was just sitting in front of my computer and saying that, you know what, though, Karn? What you did here, the old application, you did no good. These are crap. Your grades are horrible. You're not satisfied with what you wrote. You're not even applying to schools that you wanted. So there are two things we can do. First, you apply. You keep your dream high. It is up. You may or may not get that acceptance letter from the school that you wanted. Well, if you do, that's the glorious moment that you lived for. If not, eh, it's fine, because you can always go back and say, oh, you know what, in matches I'm going to that school. Just keeping the cycle up. What is the other option, I said? Well, you don't apply. Okay, yeah, I can take a gap year, then I can just take the exams, and then I can go to those fancy schools again. Yeah, the dream is up. No. I said, what is your biggest fear? It is a really hard question. And for me, I fear failing. Failing was my biggest fear. Okay, it's great that we got that down. So what are we going to do? You're going to fail. You're going to fail miserably. That's the only way you can get out of this cycle. 
you're going to jump into the thing that you fear most so that you get out of this. This torment, this torture, it's over. And if you find a way that why are you yourself pushing yourself not to doing all those stuff, yes, you can go to those fancy schools. But not, you need to sort this out. Because whatever you define as failure is wrong. Whatever you define as success, that is wrong too. And that's why I said, you know what, just go to sleep. It's January 1st. If you sleep now and wake up tomorrow morning, there's no going back. Even if you want, even if you regret, there's no going back. You cannot beg those schools to send your application again. I said, you know what? I have no idea what I'm going to do next year. But I said, I'm just going to jump into the thing that I fear most. And I'm going to take gap here. Well, we will sort out. It will sort out, but not today. Today, you're just going to go to sleep and wake up tomorrow morning. Then you can work on what you're doing. And that's how I decided not applying to university at all. And people were surprised that I said, oh, I did not even send it. Our university counselor was shocked hearing that you didn't apply? It's like, no, I didn't. Okay, we'll find something out. But the main idea was, I tried to define myself with my grades. I ignored my weaknesses. I ignored my failures. I denied them. I lived with success. Success, that was not the right meaning. Failure, which was not the actual definition. Today, I beg you, I see every day there are people doing the very same mistake that I've done for quite a bit of a long time. And it took a lot from me, a lot. You may not have it now, not tomorrow, but one day, you're gonna realize it. It could be when you're 20, 40, or tomorrow. When you do, it's gonna take all going to destroy you. And that's why I'm begging you not to do the very same mistake that 